Hello. The episode you're about to listen to is part of a multi-part series introducing an overview of Japanese history. This is a repeat of one of the original projects the History of Japan podcast was built on, and is intended to serve as an update and supplement to these original works. After 10 years, my hope is to return to this approach and to do it a little bit better given the skills that I have improved in the intervening years. If you haven't been doing so already, you should listen to these episodes sequentially, starting with episode 501. Without any further ado, enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to the History of Japan podcast, episode 504, The Great Change. When I was back in graduate school oh so many years ago, my PhD advisor, Dr. Ken Pyle, had a line he would pretty much always use whenever he got the chance in lectures, public talks, or what have you. He would say there are three decisive turning points in Japanese history, moments that saw the structure of Japanese politics and society change decisively. And for him, the important thing about these moments was that they were all triggered, so to speak, by contact with an outside power. The second two on the list were the Meiji Restoration in 1868 and the American Occupation of Japan from 1945 to 1952, about which we will certainly have much more to say down the line. For Dr. Pyle, both of these were decisive turning points in the evolution of modern Japan, and were both central to what is arguably his most famous written work, a book called Japan Rising, which contains as its major sub-argument the idea that much of Japan's political history has been shaped by forcible contact with stronger external powers. However, the very first of these turning points he dealt with really only in passing, as proof of the trend, so to speak, of change driven by contact with the outside, as a sort of motif of Japanese history that goes beyond the last two centuries. To be frank, this approach is not unusual. Within academic history as a discipline, there's generally a pretty steep divide between what we would call modern and pre-modern historians, with the split between the two being placed somewhere around 500 years ago, before is pre-modern, after is modern. As a result, it's pretty uncommon, especially for modern historians, to have much beyond a basic knowledge of pre-modern history required to teach intro courses. Generally, a pre-modernist will get it worse because they are required to know more modern history, as their periods of specialty are often less in demand for the intro classes, which make up the bulk of offerings in a given university, which is me acknowledging in a roundabout way that pre-modernists do often get the short end of the stick academically, And, being much more familiar with pre-modern Japanese history than I was ten years ago, I can decisively now say this is unfair and does nobody a service. Anyway, I don't necessarily endorse the view that the three turning points Dr. Pyle called so central are, well, necessarily that central. I think it depends a lot on what you're choosing to emphasize as important about Japanese history. Even so, it is hard to deny that all of these turning points, and especially the very first, the so-called Taika reforms of 645 CE, did not represent at least a level of change in Japanese history. Indeed, the word Taika literally means great change, which says a lot all in itself, doesn't it? And by the way, I'm like 90% sure I told this exact same story more or less as a framing device when I did this 10 years ago, but hey, I think it's a pretty good story in my defense. Anywho, what are the Taika reforms, and what makes them so important in Japanese history? To talk about this, we have to take a brief trip away from Japan's home islands and hop over to the continent for a spell, because things on the continent are about to change a great deal. As we established a few episodes ago, the various divided kingdoms of Japan first made contact with the Asian mainland, and specifically with China, sometime around 2,000 years ago. This was right in the middle of China's Han Dynasty, which is generally considered to be one of the golden ages of imperial China. However, by the time contact became more regular, the Han Dynasty was distinctly in its eastern or latter phase, 
a period when the dynasty was already much less centralized than it had been and was losing ground to powerful regional warlords who would, by around 200 CE, dispense with the dynasty altogether. What followed after the collapse of the Han Dynasty was about 400 years of division within China. First, the famous Three Kingdoms era, if you are familiar with the classic work The Romance of the Three Kingdoms and its various derivative movies, books, video games, TV shows, and so on, this is what it's based on, then the short-lived Jin Dynasty, then the Sixteen Kingdoms, then the Northern and Southern Dynasties. These are very important moments in Chinese history. For example, it was the constant pressure of war during this time which drove the migration of Han Chinese, the ethnic majority of the country, out of their homelands around the Yellow River in the north, south towards the Yangtze River and beyond. However, for our purposes, what matters about this is that for the 400-ish years when the rule of the Yamato Kingdom, the power base of Japan's emperors, was coming together, a fragmented China did not represent a substantial political threat to it. Neither, for that matter, did Korea. From the time of Korean prehistory, the peninsula had never been unified. Instead, it had been home to a combination of divided Korean kingdoms, as well as Chinese commanderies, the administrative divisions of the Han Dynasty. As we've established, the competition between those Korean kingdoms and their constant wars against each other both drove Korean immigration to Japan, spreading continental technology and culture in the process, and provided an opening for an increasingly powerful Yamato kingdom to involve itself in Korean politics to its benefit. However, by the mid to late 500 CE, right around the same time the Soga clan was securing its hold over the court as we described last episode, the winds of change were blowing on the Asian mainland. First, in 581, a new figure rose to prominence in China. His name was Yang Jin, and for most of his life he had been a general in one of China's many fragmented kingdoms of the time, the Northern Zhou Dynasty. His talent for war had led to a meteoric rise within the kingdom, dominated by an ethnic group descended from steppe nomads called the Xianbei, despite his own mixed Xianbei and Han Chinese ancestry. By early 581, the illness of the northern Zhou emperor had led to Yang Jian being appointed regent of the dynasty, at which point, in a move that, frankly, pretty much anyone who had watched at least one season of Game of Thrones should have seen coming, Yang promptly usurped his ruler and declared himself the master of a renamed Sui dynasty. Yang Jian, having restyled himself Emperor Wen, literally the cultured of Sui, promptly win a conquer in, and that talent for war and violence meant that by the end of the decade, China, which at this point did not include places like Tibet, Xinjiang, or Manchuria, was reunited under his rule. The Sui dynasty was not terribly long-lived. Despite his cultured name, Emperor Wen was a tyrannical ruler whose authority was built more on his willingness to cut off the heads of people who disagreed with him than anything else which makes you wonder why he wanted to be known as the cultured, but I guess history is written by the victors, or at least by people who are willing to decapitate you if you don't use their preferred nicknames. The fact that Wen's authority was built mostly on fear meant that after his death in 604, when his just as cruel but less competent son, Emperor Yang, took command, it did not take too long for things to start falling apart. Both Wen and his son and heir Yang launched a series of wars against neighboring powers. By the first decade of the 600s, the Sui dynasty was at war with the Champa of what's now Vietnam, with the native peoples of what's now Sichuan province, with the Turkish tribes on their northwestern border, and with the kingdom of Goguryeo in Korea. Some of these wars went fairly well, but the Korean War in particular was disastrous. It turns out Korea is a narrow peninsula full of mountain passes that are both easily defensible and inhabited by a great many people who are not very interested in being part of China, thank you very much. The disastrous wars combined with high taxes to fund them and massive labor demands for huge construction projects, like an early version of the Grand Canal between the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers, led to rebellions against the dynasty. By 618, Emperor Yang was killed in a palace coup by one of his generals because time really is a flat circle, and just a few months later, the sway itself was overthrown. This did not, however, lead to the country fragmenting once again. 
Leading the anti-Sui charge was one Li Yuan, a provincial governor whose family had served the Northern Zhou dynasty before it had been overthrown. Just as ambitious and talented, but less cruel than Emperor Wen, Li Yuan was able to take the reins of power for himself, and, restyled as Emperor Gaozu, or the Great Ancestor, established another new dynasty, the Tang. The Tang dynasty is the second golden age of imperial China in the traditional telling, and would last for 300 years. It is, as they say, kind of a big deal. And the rapid upheaval of the 600s did not end with the establishment of a new dynasty, with its imperial seat at the old Han dynasty capital of Chang'an, today the city of Xi'an. For Emperor Gaozu of Tang, built on the expansionism of the Sui dynasty, preferring to secure China's frontiers with conquest, but also a mixture of diplomacy. You do sometimes hear the Tang dynasty called more diplomatic than the Sui, and that's kind of true. Emperor Gaozu and his successors were not as reliant on pure military force to secure their new empire's borders, relying instead on a combination of war and diplomacy, but it's also unfair to characterize the Tang, especially the early Tang rulers, as pure Confucian pacifists, who ruled with moral force and authority rather than an iron fist. The policy of the Tang in Korea serves as a good example here. Starting with the second Tang emperor, Taizong, the Tang dynasty began to intervene in Korean politics just as the Sui had before it. However, this time the Chinese did not enter the region without allies. Tang Taizong worked out an alliance with one of the very few female Korean rulers in history, Queen Seondok of Shilla, and the subsequent tang shilla alliance was able to conquer much of the other two Korean kingdoms of Baekje and Goguryeo. By 663 CE, those two kingdoms had been wiped out. Baekje in particular had continued to receive military aid from the Yamato kingdom down to the very end. At the final stand of Baekje in the late summer of 663 at Baekgang, thousands of Yamato troops were on hand to try and stave off the collapse of their longtime ally. That help, however, did not make a difference. Baekje was crushed and subsumed by Shilla all the same. In the future, the tang shilla alliance would briefly break down and result in a war between the two, but after Shilla's victory, unifying much of the rest of Korea under their rule in the process, the two governments would return to friendly relations. Much like the Tang, the Shilla dynasty would remain in place until the 900s. Which, okay, we're decently far into this episode at this point, and so far none of this has been about Japan. Why does it matter? Well, simply put, because it radically remade the playing board, so to speak, on which the game of politics was being played. If we return to that quotation from Dr. Pyle, part of his underlying logic for highlighting those three moments as major turning points in Japanese history was that they were all the results of pressure from outside powers. In the cases of the later Meiji Restoration and the U.S. occupation of Japan after World War II, that outside power was, of course, the United States and, more broadly, Western nation-states in general, whose economic, political, and military power forced Japanese leaders to consider changes that previously would not have been thinkable. And in the case of the Taika reforms, part of the impetus for changes that previously would not have been thinkable was the new situation on the continent. For pretty much all of the history of the Yamato Kingdom, China had been divided into comparatively weak warring kingdoms, none of which were a serious threat to Japan. Korea had been similarly divided into warring states that not only were not a threat, but whose conflicts could be manipulated to the advantage of the Yamato Kingdom. Now things were very different. Now the continent was centralized enough to threaten Japan. And indeed, even if a military threat never emerged from the continent, which was not necessarily a foregone conclusion, though in the end the leaders of the Tang Dynasty decided an invasion of Japan was not worth the potential costs, the power, splendor, and cultural dynamism of the Tang Dynasty was hard to miss for those in power in Japan, who eyed the wealthy court of the Tang emperors with envy. And of course, Remember all the challenges the Yamato Kingdom faced in the 500s which we talked about last week. The memory of those civil conflicts certainly factored into the envy with which Japanese rulers looked at the more centralized governments of the continent. Of course, 
If you read period sources like the Nihon Shoki for their description of the Taika reforms, none of this worry or envy in relation to the continent shows up at all. In those cases, the sources are pretty clear. What drove the Taika reforms was concern over the domineering power of the Soga clan. As we covered last week, over the course of the 500s, and particularly after their defeat of their rivals in the Mononobe clan in 587, during a war of succession within the imperial family, the Soga clan became Japan's preeminent political power. In many ways, they were the puppet masters of a line of emperors descended from or allied by marriage to Soga clan interests. That level of Soga clan domination was, of course, not very popular with those who were not a part of the Soga clan, but challenging their rule militarily was not possible. The Soga were also very central to Japan's trade with the continent, which had made their clan extremely wealthy, and militarily extremely powerful. By 645 CE, Soga no Iruka, the Soga clan Omuraji or chieftain, was one of the most powerful men in the whole country, arguably, in fact, the most powerful. Ultimately, what brought down the Soga was not battle, but a clever bit of backstabbing, led by two of the leading figures at the imperial court, an imperial prince, Naka no Oe, the son of the then reigning empress Kyogoku and a previous emperor, and the Omuraji or clan chieftain of the Nakatomi clan, Nakatomi no Kamatari. Prince Naka no Oe's involvement is easy enough to understand, as he himself would justify things at a later date, he was concerned the imperial family to which he belonged was being sidelined to such a degree the Soga clan would eventually supplant them altogether, and saw a sudden decapitating blow as the best way to defeat the Soga quickly and cleanly. As for the Nakatomi clan, they had been aligned against the Soga for quite a while. The Nakatomi clan had been one of the groups to argue against the Soga-backed adoption of Buddhism in Japan a little more than a century earlier. As a rival clan, it makes sense the Nakatomi leadership would be concerned with the growing power of the Soga to dominate Japan's politics. Fortunately for the Nakatomi, they had been on the sidelines of the Mononobe Soga War and thus escaped unscathed, but as a result they also lacked the strength necessary to directly challenge Soga rule. Instead, Prince Naka no Oe and the Nakatomi Omuraji Kamatari cooked up a plan. On the twelfth day of the sixth lunar month of 645 CE, ambassadors from Korea's rival kingdoms were slated to make an appearance at court, at that point set up at a temporary location in what's now Nara Prefecture. On that date, Soga no Iroka would naturally be present given the importance of Korea to Japan's foreign policy. The anti-Soga forces would take advantage to launch a coup. They were able to win over an additional co-conspirator, a distant Soga relative whose daughter was married to Prince Naka no Oe, and who apparently felt that being in charge of a weaker Soga clan was worth more than being a minor member of a more powerful one. As it happened, things came off more or less perfectly. I will turn here to the description of the fateful day included in the Nihon Shoki. Quote, Hereupon Prince Naka no Oe ordered the guard of the gates to fasten all the twelve gates at the same time, and to allow nobody to pass. Then he called together the guards of the gates to one place and promised them rewards. Prince Naka no Oe then took into his own hands a long spear and hid it at one side of the hall. Nakatomi no Kamatari and his people armed with bows and arrows lent their aid. Soga no Katsumaro, that minor Soga relative, was sent to give two swords in a case to Komaru, Saheki no Omuraji, and Amida, Katsuraki no Wake Inu Kahi no Muraji, two other conspirators, with the message, up, up, make haste to slay him. Soga no Komaru and the other tried to send down their rice with water, but were so frightened they brought it up again. Nakatomi no Kamatari chided and encouraged them. Kureyamada Maru no Omi feared lest the reading of the memorial should come to an end before Komaru and his companions arrived. His body was moist with streaming sweat and his voice indistinct, and his hands shook. Soga no Iruka wondered at this and inquired of him, saying, Why dost thou tremble? Yamada Maro answered and said, It is being near the Empress that makes me afraid, so that unconsciously the perspiration pours from me. 
Prince Nakano Oe, seeing that Komaru and his companion, intimidated by Iruka's prestige, were about to shirk and did not come forward, cried out, Ya! Yeah! and forthwith coming out with Komaru and his companion, fell upon Iruka without warning, and with a sword cut open his head and shoulder. Iruka started up in alarm when Komaru with a turn of his hand flourished his sword and wounded him in the leg. Iruka rolled over to where the empress sat, bowing his head to the ground, and said, She who occupies the hereditary dignitary is the child of heaven. I, her servant, am conscious of no crime, and I beseech her to deign to make examination into this. The empress was greatly shocked, and addressed Prince Nakano Oe, saying, I know not what has been done, what is the meaning of this? Nakano Oe prostrated himself on the earth and made representation to her majesty, saying, Soga no Iruka wished to destroy utterly the celestial house and subvert your solar dignity. Are the Soga to be substituted for the celestial descendants? The empress at once got up and went into the interior of the palace, whereupon Komaru Saheki no Muraji and Amida Waka Inukahi no Muraji slew Iruka. Now obviously there's a lot to unpack in all of that. First, I do love the detail that two of the conspirators were so frightened they brought up their rice again, in other words, nervous puking over having to assassinate someone. To be fair, I imagine it's a pretty nerve-wracking thing to do, but man, it must hurt to have that be a detail which is forever immortalized about you. Also, I absolutely love the bit about the minor Soga relative whose job it is to read a petition to the throne to stall while everyone gets into place, and who is so nervous he's sweating like crazy, passing things off by saying he's just nervous to be around the Imperial Presence. That's a great excuse, and I'm going to use it next time I'm nervous during a speech. I'm not worried, I'm just nervous about the Imperial Presence. Probably a bit more important to note, of course, is that the coup was successfully carried off. Soga no Iruka was killed and the remaining Soga clan leadership, when they realized what had happened and saw their allies abandoning them, locked themselves in the clan's fortified manor and set it ablaze. By the way, in the process, they also destroyed several earlier existing works of history, which we alluded to in previous episodes. Presumably, the Kojiki and Nihon Shoki are at least based in part on surviving fragments of those earlier works, but it is impossible to know for sure. Two days after the assassination, Empress Kyogoku abdicated, initially in favor of Prince Nakano Oe, but he refused the throne on the advice of Nakatomi no Kamatari, who pointed out it would make the coup look like a cynical seizure of power, rather than an attempt to defend the imperial throne. He suggested Kyogoku's brother be elevated instead. Nakano Oe would not take office for two more generations, until after the passing of this brother, known as Emperor Kotoku, as well as Empress Kyogoku again, who returned to the throne for six years afterwards under the regnal name Saime. It was only after her death that Nakano Oe, also known as Emperor Tenji, finally was coronated as emperor. And it is this series of imperial reigns, with Nakano Oe slash Emperor Tenji and Nakatomi no Kamatari calling the shots from behind the scenes, that are associated with the so-called Taika reforms. The goal of the reforms was essentially to remake Japan's government administration to centralize it on continental lines, both to protect against a growing perception of threat from the continent and to strengthen the power of the emperors themselves to protect against future attempts to strip their power. The reforms were not always successful, mind you. The policy of supporting a pro-Japanese ally in the Korean Kingdom of Baekje did not pay dividends, when said ally was crushed by Tang Dynasty-backed Shilla, for example, but in many other ways, they did. The Taika reforms were not a single package of laws passed in the immediate aftermath of the anti-Soga coup, but rather a series of policy shifts that took place over the subsequent decades aimed at copying Chinese models. For example, on the Lunar New Year of 646, Emperor Kotoku announced a four-article edict remaking the administrative system, at the urging of Nakatomi no Kamatari and Prince Oe slash the future Emperor Tenji. That edict abolished old positions like the Omuraji clan chieftains who held substantial power over their own lands in favor of a system of provincial officials led by a provincial governor appointed by the imperial throne, just as the system worked in China. 
Similarly, villages were to be reorganized into more consistent units of 50 households, with aldermen granted special privileges by the state in exchange for enforcing laws and ensuring taxes were collected, another innovation borrowed from the Chinese model. Around the same time, the court announced a new system for timekeeping based once again on imperial China, the Nengol. This term literally means something like era name and is based on a system that was in use in imperial China at the time. As initially conceived, every so often court diviners would choose a new era, with the first one being Taika, from which the Taika reforms take their name, and that year being Taika I. The next year would be Taika II, and so on, until the era name stopped, for whatever reason, being auspicious. Natural disasters could cause this, as did the death of the emperor, but there were other reasons one might want to move on from a given era name. At that point, a new era would be designated, and the cycle would begin once again. This system was first introduced in 646, but was used only intermittently in the intervening decades. However, starting in the early 700s, the Nengo system became standard. It remains in use in Japan to this day, though during the 1800s it went through a big shift, which we're going to talk about when we get to it. In 668, meanwhile, Prince Oe, now on the throne as Emperor Tenji, ordered the compilation of Japan's first defined legal codes, the so-called Omi-ryo laws. Subsequent revision to the administrative and legal code would continue for the next 100 years. Now, this is more or less the narrative I got once upon a time of what we call the Asuka period, named after the village of Asuka in southern Nara where the imperial court spent a good chunk of the 500s and 600s. A combination of growing external threat from the continent and concern over Soga domination of the court led to the 645 coup and then to the reforms implemented by the coup's victors. Collectively, those pressures led to the Taika reforms and the remaking of the imperial government on a more centralized model. It's a tidy narrative, and certainly the internal logic works, but there's a few ways in which it doesn't quite fit. For example, the adoption of reforms proved a bit haphazard. It took place over the course of several decades, which doesn't exactly fit the notion that all of this is because of some perceived existential threat to the survival of Japan, does it? So maybe the story is not quite as neat and tidy as all that. Since the 1970s, there's been a growing body of research questioning this neat and tidy evaluation of this period and calling for a reframing in how we tie all these events together. For example, while it's easy to point to the post-645 reforms and call them a reaction to Soga domination, things become a bit more complicated when you look before 645 and realize that even at that point, reforms were being put into place to strengthen the central government. It was under the rule of the Soga clan that Prince Shotoku, who we mentioned last week, he was the one who rallied the troops during the Soga Mononobe War, implemented Japan's very first administrative code. His so-called 17-article constitution, crafted upon Shotoku's return from a diplomatic mission to Sui Dynasty China, is not the most practical. It's concerned more with the philosophy of government than with laying out clear rules and structures. But it was a meaningful reform nonetheless. In particular, the incorporation of Confucian notions of merit as well as of benevolent hierarchy that inferiors should serve superiors, but that superiority is predicated on service to others, would prove very influential on governing philosophy going forward. It was also under the Soga that the very first attempts to rank Japan's aristocrats, and to do so based on merit as servants rather than by birth, was implemented in the early 600s. That ranking system would continue to evolve going forward and will be important to us in the future, but I want to note that the Soga were the first ones to implement it. So perhaps it makes sense to talk about a long century of reform from the cementing of Soga power in the 580s all the way to the early 700s, with government leaders from differing government cliques sharing an overall concern with strengthening the power of the imperial state. I also want to note that these attempts to strengthen the power of the state were not always successful. In Emperor Tenji's final years in the 660s, the state was racked by one more succession dispute. 
in a pattern that will be somewhat familiar to us going forward, Tenji named his younger brother, the future Emperor Tenmu, as his heir, but eventually began to sideline him in favor of a younger son by a favored concubine. When Tenji finally died in 671, his son and brother fought a brief ten-month war over the succession, egged on by opposing factions within the court, with the Nakatomi clan of Tenji's old ally Nakatomi no Kamatari supporting the brother, and the remnants of the old Soga and anti-Nakatomi families siding with the son. So, really not that different from the Soga Mononobe War almost a century earlier. When the war ended with the victory of the brother and his installation as Emperor Tenmu, the drive towards centralization continued, and the pattern of reform picked back up. Civil wars of this type became less common going forward, at least for a time, and this too is arguably the result of the centralizing reforms of this era, which made it harder for rival clans to challenge the sitting ruler or heir. Tenmu and his wife and successor, the future Empress Jito, were critical to this shift. It was in particular under Jito that three of the final crucial changes of the 600s were inaugurated. First was the move away from, well, moving. Jito established the first semi-permanent capital in Japanese history, built on a Chinese model at Fujiwara-kyo, what's now Kashihara in Nara Prefecture. In previous eras of Yamato rule, the location of the imperial capital and court would rotate on a somewhat regular basis around what's now Kyoto, Osaka, and Nara, the Kansai area. There are many, many theories about why this was, as we've covered, from the administrative, moving the court closer to so-called trouble zones to keep an eye on things, to family politics, rotating the court to please powerful clans by offering them the prestige of hosting the throne, to defense, for example, during the early 600s, the court moved from the seaside area of what's now Osaka to the mountainous interior of Nara. Maybe that was a precaution against a feared invasion by the Tang dynasty. It's even been suggested this was a form of religious taboo. Shinto today retains strong taboos against decay and uncleanliness, so that, for example, shrines are regularly torn down and rebuilt on a somewhat consistent schedule. Perhaps the constant relocation of the capital was a part of this as well, with the moves being timed based on certain omens. Once again, nobody's quite sure why. The movement is treated as just normal in the written record, and no one gives an explanation for it, because it's assumed any reader would already be familiar with why this is happening. Which is, from a meta perspective, one of the real challenges of being a historian working with primary sources, first-hand accounts in other words. It's challenging to understand them without a good grasp of the context, because authors making first-hand accounts have certain assumptions about what their readers may or may not know that you, a historian working much later, will not always share, or which you may not always be able to figure out. Anyway, whatever the explanation for the rotation of the capital, starting with this time the rotations began to slow. They did not end altogether. Fujiwara-kyo would not remain the final site of the imperial throne, and it would take another century for the seat of the emperors to become permanent. But Jito was the first to inaugurate a critical step towards a more settled and larger central government in a more permanent capital. We'll talk more about this shift in the next two episodes. It's pretty clear that this shift towards a more settled government was necessary to accommodate the growing governmental bureaucracy of the imperial state. After all, running an empire modeled on imperial China meant having a much larger government in general, and one that was correspondingly hard to move every so often. Jito was also the first to shift the language by which the emperor was addressed. Prior to her reign, the people we call the emperors of Japan were addressed by a variety of titles, the most common of which was probably Ogimi, or Great King. Jito was the one to formalize the use of Tenno, Heavenly Sovereign, a term designed deliberately to evoke two of the more common names used to refer to China's emperor, Tianzi, or Son of Heaven, which has the same character for Tan in Tenno, and Huangdi, or Emperor, where the Huang is the same as the No in Tenno. That linguistic shift, which was retroactively applied to previous emperors in subsequent writings, was clearly intended to draw a symbolic equivalence between Japan and China's rulers and this will not be the last time we see someone try and do that. Finally, 
Tenmu and especially Jito were central to shifting the very image of the emperor and the throne. If you look, for example, at Prince Shotoku's 17-article constitution from a century earlier, the justification for a ruler's power given there is their superior morals. It's a distinctly Confucian idea based on the Chinese notion of the Mandate of Heaven, where the ruler is legitimated by heaven because of their benevolence to the people. Tenmu and Jito began to emphasize a very different model of emperorship, in line with their notion that they were not merely kings, but heavenly sovereigns. Their proclamations are tinged with the language of divinity, referencing their divine descent as Akitsukami or shining deities, descended from Amaterasu. It was under Jito in particular that the Kojiki, the first surviving written history, was compiled. Its genealogy of emperors descended from gods is a clear example of this desire to legitimate the throne itself as divine and thus protect it from political interference. Of course, painting themselves as divine monarchs was clearly useful for two rulers trying to centralize their rule, but it will also have important effects down the line, particularly on the fate of the imperial house itself. On balance, our picture of the 600s should be one of a move towards a more centralized Japan on the Chinese model, however we choose to interpret what drove those events, worries about the continent, concerns over powerful clans, or anything else, the impact is very much clear. Next week we'll see that drive continue into what we call the Nara period. For now, that's all for this week, thank you very much for listening. This show is a part of the Facing Backward podcast network. You can find out more about this show and our other shows at FacingBackward.com, and you can support the network at Patreon.com slash FacingBackward. Special thanks to those who have given at our shout-out tier, Yan Leonard, Stephen Elkins, Martin Oliveira, Clark Canning, Ian Kellett, Matt Haynes, Jackie Frostocker, Monkey Sack, Alayla McCulloch, Karen Murphy, Peter Wales, Robert Prine, William, Arno, Jonas Brandis, Nicholas Kroll, Jerry Spinrad, Jared Stevens, Jeffrey Dwork, Stefan Hrushka, Joshua Kane, Robbie and Cat, Jacob Key, Aaron Finkbeiner, an anonymous Anna's Hummingbird, Mark Sy, Gill, Leslie Ikuta, Trash Taste Enjoyer, Harrison Reese, Shimao Toshio's History of Yaponesia podcast, A House is a Perfectly Cromulent Mascot, The Fish I Catch Are Road Scholars Compared to Samuel Alito, Schmuck, and everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Special thanks also to new donors to the History of Japan Patreon, Yana and Mark, for donating to support the show. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time for the Nara period.